We've reached the pinnacle, the flagship, the apex, if you will, well-named Flydigi, the most expensive and feature-rich controller offered from China's number one controller company, Flydigi. What sits in my hand like an eagle on a perch is the Apex 3. Don't ask me where the Apex 1 and 2 are. They don't exist on the manufacturer's website or time and space. This is going to be a comprehensive deep dive of this controller as well as the other variant that doesn't have this beautiful faceplate and piss yellow buttons. But they both share the same equally whack rear buttons and waste of budget allocation with things like a built-in screen and adaptive triggers that don't really make good implementation of it. This video is time stamped into chapters, which are in the description of the video if you want to jump around. I don't recommend jumping because you could sprain your ankles. You should probably just hang out and absorb all the gamer goo that I'm going to be sprinkling throughout this review. Let's get it. I do strongly recommend watching my Fly Digi Vader 3 review from a couple of weeks ago as I do lay out the differences between the models as there is a lot of confusion between the Fly Digi website and listings on Amazon and other third party vendors and I spend a lot more time with the software suite, a full tour, how to install it as it is kind of finicky, you gotta go digging for it. It's all broken down in that video so think of that as the 101, the jumping off point, the introduction to this video and this is kind of the follow up with the flagship, the higher end controller. So if there's any confusion or gaps in information, it's probably filled in in that previous review which will be linked in the description below and I strongly recommend watching her. As for the packaging and included accessories on Fly Digi's flagship, the most expensive controller in their lineup and also the most feature rich, I do have the limited edition variant which oddly enough actually comes with a carrying case despite being the exact same controller. Prices for both of these on screen here. Yeah. Other than that you will notice a more sexual outer box. I, I don't know why I described it as sensual but you have this cosmetic graphic on here and it lets you know that you're going to launch your bitch ass into space with this controller. Fly to Galaxy, not Fly fly to the galaxy, but just fly to galaxy. This is a Chinese controller. This is the standard model outer box, and one of the key features is going to be those force feedback triggers, which are similar to the adaptive triggers on the PlayStation 5, but obviously not implemented as, okay, I'm just gonna say it, not implemented as well. And unlike me, if you can read, pause the box to read some of these key features. You will have what I'm assuming is a thank you letter from the CEO and a pretty badass looking signature, carrying case on the limited, foam divider on the standard, plastic cutout to get the instruction manual, pamphlet, or brochure out, you have a 10 foot braided USB-C cable, no dust covers on the A or C end, you do have a Velcro tie back that will stay connected, and this is actually very lightweight and flexible, I really do like this included cable. And since it's not permanently connected, not proprietary, you can use your own. You do also have your 2.4 gigahertz dongle or receiver, controller being the transmitter, this being the receiver, plastic sneeze guard, and I'm gonna be honest with you stallions and stallionettes, I've already pulled this controller out of the plastic and looked at it and oh my dear lord, this is probably one of the sickest looking controllers I have ever seen in my life and keep in mind I have put my corneas on a gamepad or two in my day. This looks so fucking sick. Now, in case you're thinking, Kevin, I'm already fucked with fingerprints, you actually have a little sticker protecting this translucent shell from smudges. Oh, never mind. It's only this big. I thought it covered the whole thing. Only covers that screen. Little envelope with your documentation. Uh, what appears to be a SIM popper tool for a cell phone, and there's instructions on what to do with this, but they're in Chinese characters, and I don't know what to do with that. However, there are two QR codes. If you scan this bad boy, that will take you to an English PDF document that you can scroll through. These are stickers, by the way, because it's not a custom than premium or pro controller unless there is stickers in the box. We all know that. And then lifting up on this plastic divider, there is nothing underneath there. Over here on the limited edition, underneath the carrying case, you are going to have your documentation, which is identical to the last model. Carrying case itself is actually very nice. Not only cosmetically, you have a nice metal pull tab here, zippers all blacked out. You have a nice little grab handle, or you could attach this to a backpack. But most importantly, this actually provides a good amount of protection as this is a pretty hard clamshell. I can't click down the thumbsticks or anything. Oh my lord. I knew what was going to be in here, but I just didn't know how colorful and vibrant it was going to be. A couple things I like about this carrying case, you do have individual cutouts for your thumbstick caps, also your transmitter in there, and what I really like is the USB-C cable does not put pressure on the thumbsticks when you close it, cocking them out at a weird angle and thus speeding up the problem of stick drift before it even gets to you. The same exact USB-C cable, and this is a little trinket, if you will, metal keychain. That's pretty cool. It actually matches the controller too. A very interesting factoid is that you have removable thumbstick caps, but for absolute no reason because there is no swappable option. You have these shorties which are about the height of a stalker and I really hate the mechanism to get them on and off because it's kind of a finicky bee. I wish it was just magnetized like the Elite or Razor Wolverine controllers. I will say the rubber that they're using is incredibly grippy and I love these to the point to where if they were a little bit higher I wouldn't even put on Control Freaks or aftermarket thumbstick caps. They're just that grippy. Cosmetically the stalker was gorgeous and this one looks good. I will say it's a little bit too rambunctious for me and yes I have other colorful and vibrant controllers on the wall but that's 
a two-part reason. One, it looks good on camera behind me, but two, a lot of those I spec'd out in custom controller builders, and they just work. They look good. Everything blends together good. This over here clashes a little clumsy. The reason for that being the blue on the thumbsticks doesn't really match the blue on the faceplate, and I'm not a big yellow guy, but this yellow and blue isn't personally tickling my corneas, but if this is your color theme and your game room or your setup, fucking yeah, you got big bird buttons on the back, and I believe this is actually based off either an individual or an esports team over there in China. Cosmetically, I'm gonna give this a 6 and this a 10. I mean, just wait till I turn it on. That'll really blow your mind. <sighs> that is a good looking controller in my personal opinion. You've got that clear faceplate, which is of course showing you what's underneath it, giving you a little tease saying, hey, look at my guts, look at my internals, which are also pretty good looking. You've got these mechanical face buttons which we'll talk about later because they are a joy. Hybrid D-pad wheel with eight distinct gates or steps, anti-friction rings, uh, rubberized grips. It, it, it puts a tick in all the boxes. Despite the fact the controller goes completely irresponsive in the application sometimes, can we just take a minute to see how god darn cool that looks cosmetically? Rad. As for ergonomics and comfort, this is one of the most comfortable controllers I've ever used for a couple of reasons. The shell design, the dimensions, is identical to an Xbox One or Series controller, which is a good thing because I think that's pretty much pushing perfection when it comes to a gamepad. For me, it feels real nice. But then you have this really nice feeling plastic on this front faceplate, and then these really nice rubber grips, which are incredibly soft and supple and just nice on the hands. Not all rubber grips feel alike. Some of them are kind of hard and not that big of a step up over hard plastic. This feels squishy and nice while not feeling like it's going to break apart in the first few months, like Scuff's old design. Finishing up comfort, the four rear buttons feel phenomenal, at least comfort wise. There are a couple of complaints with these inner buttons and being able to remap these with the software, but we'll talk about that later during the rear button section. Comfort Wise, this is bomb. A 10 out of 10. I will say there is a different feel on the faceplate of the limited edition. It's not a soft touch rubberized material, but it doesn't have that same slick plastic feeling as the standard. They both feel good, but they feel different, if that makes sense. And I personally would give a 9.5 to the comfort on this one and a 10 to the standard. Feels a little bit better on my hands. Ooh, yeah. Also, you feel where the graphics are. It's actually raised a little bit where this hydro dipping or this graphic is stuck on here. Uh, I don't like that. As for build quality, it is quite a bit better than the previous fly digi models that I have tested, which I should hope so because this is a more expensive model, but everything does feel a lot more buttoned down and secure. And if anything does go wrong, all fly digiru controllers are covered with a one year standardized warranty. However, that might be kind of hard to activate considering a lot of people are buying fly digi controllers from Alibaba, AliExpress, Wish.com. Yes, you can buy these on Amazon. That's where I purchased this model. And I recommend you do go through a reputable vendor such as Amazon or well, I was about to say Walmart, but I don't think they stock these controllers just because you're dealing with a reputable company that has some kind of a customer support system and a standardized refund policy. But this should, in essence, be covered by a one-year warranty. As for the D-pad or direction buttons, it's the same story as the Vader 3 and Vader 3 Pro. Actually, I'm pretty sure all Fly Digi models use the exact same D-pad currently, which is a hybrid, so it has a four-point in there as well as a wheel, similar to what you get with the stock Xbox controller. Difference here being you do have eight distinct gates, so you have separate steps for your diagonal inputs, which could be good for you if you use the D-pad a lot. Maybe you're playing some retro games, platformers, modern games, you're generally just using the D-pad to swap through weapons or navigate menus. The only thing I don't like about this D-pad is it sticks pretty gosh darn far from the front shell, a little bit further than I think it needs to, and it's not swappable, but it does feel secure. 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10. As for the facer action buttons, they are mechanical switches. I couldn't find a tap life cycle, how many millions of clicks they're rated for before they shit out on you. An average failure rate leads me to assume that these simply do not have a tap life cycle because not all mechanical switches are created equal, just like not all Hall Effect thumbstick modules are created equal. Huge video coming in the near future, disassembling potentiometer and Hall Effect thumbstick modules, going over articles online, maybe even some interviews with some of the developers of these technologies. For example, Ghoulie Kit, who is really trendsetting and was the first commercial controller company to start pushing that technology and then a shitload started coming out of the woodworks with Machiniki and or Mike and Ike, Game Sir. I just veered off course and got really off topic but my god we need to talk about Hall Effect thumbsticks and we're going to in depth on this channel. You can still get stick drift with those bad boys by the way. It's very very rare and would probably take several years if you do get it at all but you can get stick drift with Hall Effect sticks. No god please no no no! These are probably my favorite mechanical switches to date. I liked razors for the longest time and praised them as being the bees knees and mules tits. These might be better because you have a nice resistance. The way that it snaps back, it, it's it's actually pushing your finger back out. Like, hey, hey, I don't want to be pressed. It's pushing your finger back out in such a way that it just feels so fucking satisfying. 
Sizing, spacing, and placement is identical to a standard Xbox Series controller. The only thing I don't like about that is the roundness of the buttons. Stock Xbox buttons are quite round in comparison to the PlayStation 5 DualSense, which are more flat, and I prefer that. Other than that, these are amazing. Uh, 9 out of 10. No, 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 no. These should really have a tap life cycle. Even if that's just a little feature on the box winking at you saying, hey, I shouldn't break on you for 10 million clicks. If you're putting high quality mechanical or digital switches in your controller, I feel like you'd want to brag about that. As for the accessory button suite, so that's going to be this awkward start and select, which are cocked at an angle and are also oval shaped. I crapped on them a little bit more than I should have during the Vader 3 review. They're not terrible. They work. You can pause the game and you can get into your select menu over here. You have your home button down here as well. And on the back, you do have an on and off slider. So if you're pressing the home button and the controller's not turning on for you, there is an actual on off toggle in the back, which I really like that if you just instantly want to cut battery life to it, you can there instead of trying to turn off a PlayStation or Xbox controller where you have to hold down the home button. Uh, no problem with the accessory button suite. I'm not offended. Eight out of 10. Now, as far as these thumbsticks, analog sticks, joysticks, front niblets, diblets, doodads, whatever the hell you want to call them, you have anti-friction rings, so you're going to glide along that smooth plastic when you're at full lock on the outside of the thumbstick gates. These are hella short thumbsticks. You're going to want to extend them with some kind of control freaks or thumbstick cap add-ons. I have a creator code for that it's in the description. Make sure you check that out. Biggest complaint here is the fact that these are removable, but there's no options to switch to, so that's just stupid. The rubber is stupid grippy. Love that. Clicking down L3 and R3 feels tight and secure. And as far as control freak compatibility, I've got some white galaxies for PlayStation 4 and 5 as they use the same thumbstick caps, and these are gonna be too tight for me. Couldn't make it fit. And then you have the red infernos over here for the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller, which is funny they call it the Pro Controller because it doesn't have any Pro Controller features. It's a stalker from Nintendo. Absolutely not. Too tight for me. Black Omnis over here for the Xbox One and Series, which also use the same thumbstick cap. Fuck no, you can't use anything on this control freak wise, except for their universals, which will work with anything because they're universal. They're just slip overs like little condoms or caps that pop over and that's going to be your best bet because the standardized sizes don't work with this controller. Now as far as navigating the on-screen menu which is going to have full control of the controller being able to switch between X input and D input being able to swap through profiles check battery life etc is pretty cool however it is difficult because everything is in Chinese characters. In order to activate the menu hold down the home button for about five seconds it's a good long time and you have these Chinese characters I don't know what any of these mean but I select the first one by hitting A and this is an important one one. This is going to switch you between X and D input. So X is the modern standard. However, D input will help you with compatibility on some older titles and launchers. And even though you might not understand the Chinese characters on the main menu, if you just click through them, you can kind of figure out what's going on. These are going to be the four profiles. This I'm assuming is some kind of brightness. Yep, that's the screen brightness. There's just some information about your firmware version and a QR code you can scan with the instruction manual. And this option is blacked out. I do wish you could also control the brightness, color, or effects of this little screen. But yeah, this screen works. I just hate the fact that you have to navigate all of the functions with one button and there is no English characters. Alrighty, comrades, we are wired over here in gamepad tester. And at first I was not getting a visual representation. It just looked like this. Actually, no, it looked like I'll show you exactly what it looked like. Oh, that's cool. Pressing the home button turns it on and off. I can actually use this like a mouse aiming on screen. I press it again, disables it, locks off that cursor to where now I got to pick up my mouse. That's cool. But this is the visual representation I was getting a second ago. As you can see, you don't have the radial wheel but you can see axes is one, two, three, and five are your vertical and horizontal movement on the sticks. I'd like more data than that, please. So I'm going to switch to X input on the controller, which I already showed you how to do during the little screen walkthrough. Not the perfect resting value we like to see of 0 0.00002 or 0 0.00392, but there is no out of the box stick drift with these bad boys, despite the fact they're wandering the yard a little bit. Giving them a slow spin in the circularity test, you will see pretty good readings for potentiometer thumbstick modules, which are generally going to be in the 12 to 15 percentile range. They can get lower. For example, the NGL mini sticks from Thrustmaster. And I have tested some potentiometer and Hall Effect thumbstick modules in the past that have gotten down to that one percentile range, but these are not bad by any stretch of the imagination. These thumbsticks are accurate and I'd take them into battle. Time for us to play bump bump because we're talking about these bumpers. You do have a little bit of stippling for grip, which extends onto the triggers as well. I do like that. I like that these can be actuated with the tip or with the meat of your index finger as opposed to most other 
leather bumpers, which if they're on a swivel, you have a hard time pressing them here. These are very nice. Eight out of 10, eight out of 10, please. As for the triggers, they are incredibly light, too light for my liking. It's like there's no resistance. You're just pressing them and they're just going in. There's no resistance. Yeah, these are very light. Also, there is no trigger locks or stops, which is quite stinky considering this is a pro controller. But what this controller does have is adaptive triggers similar to what you'd see in the PlayStation 5. However, it's not implemented quite as sensually because, well, Sony Interactive Entertainment programs those features, bakes them directly into their games to make full use of the DualSense controller. Jeez, look at the fingerprints already accumulating here. That's the only downside to this controller. Keep yourself a little microfiber wipe to dust her off. Degreaser, if you will. And as for the rear buttons, I grabbed this limited edition John because these bad boys are yellow. As these are identical to the Vader 3 that I just reviewed a couple weeks ago, you're going to hear a lot of the same words thrown at you. But if you, have, if you haven't seen that video, I'm going to get more articulate, bust out my thesaurus and try and switch up the words on you. It would be ideal if all four of these buttons were here and here, right where you want to naturally rest your hands. But where your middle fingers are, you do have two buttons there for you. If you want to extend them out, you can hit these other two, although covering all four of them simultaneously is a little uncomfortable. It's actually really uncomfortable. You also cannot rebind these buttons on the fly, which is dumb for lack of a better word. And you need a software program that is only available on the PC. You cannot install it on the Switch, which is the console that this is designed for. Although from what I'm hearing and seeing, it seems like a lot of gamers are picking this up for PC rather than Switch. But it's bad that you cannot rebind these on the fly. And in order to rebind them or map them, you need the Space Station software, which is a little bit of a trek to get. Of course, you already caught my Vader 3 review. So I walked you through where to get that software suite, which we're going to brush over in this video because I spent like eight minutes walking you step by step in that previous video, which is going to be linked in the description below. That's the 101 course that you got to go to first before you step into this advanced course or the professor's going to kick you right on out. But within the Fly Digi Space Station app, you can set up profiles that you can switch between on the fly. You can rebind those buttons, which will transfer over to the switch. But to do that initial setup, you need a laptop or desktop. This is also kind of nitpicky. The outermost buttons and the innermost buttons, so the ones on the hand grips and the ones on this back shell, have a pretty different sound. Yeah, I personally think these sound a little bit more secure. They're quieter and these sound and feel a little bit more toyish. This is Target. This is Walmart over here. Got to have stab insurance to go over here. I don't know what I graded the rear buttons on during the Vader 3 review, but this Apex 3 has pretty much the same buttons and how I'm feeling today. My vibe with it is six out of 10. These are six out of 10 rear buttons all day. And I do kind of feel like that's being generous too, because you can't bind them on the fly and the inner buttons you have to really work for. You have to want to hit them. Six out of 10. Now the software program you need to control this controller is actually different than the Vader 3 and 3 Pro. I really dislike when manufacturers have separate applications for different controllers in the lineup. Please have one software suite or application to control all of your models. I understand it's a cost cutting thing. It makes it very unsmooth for us, the end user, the gamer. By Googling Fly Digi Apex 3 software, the first result is going to be Game Center. And it's going to take you to this website, which I will have linked in the description below for your one click ease of use. This is on Apple, Android. Don't worry about this activation tool. This is the application that you need. And if you have the Vader 3 or 3 Pro, install this application. And it does say will soon support the Apex 3. So that is good that they're going to get away from this older version and just implement everything into the 3.0. But once you click on it, it's not a zip file or anything. It's a .exe and it'll run you through the initial setup. Now I have it pinned down here to the taskbar for easy access. As you can see, my controller is recognized and I really do like that it notices that this is the limited edition Tiangong instead of just the black standard variant. That, that's really cool. Let's click on PC mode setting over here. And the first thing it's going to tell you is that you do need to hit apply in order for these changes to take effect. That's pretty much the business in all controller applications. You make the change and then you hit confirm or apply and it takes effect on the actual memory on the controller. So even if you're playing on the console that it's meant for, you have that onboard profile storage. They have a pretty good diagnostic tool built in by clicking on test over here. You can get a real time representation of your thumbsticks. And I do mean real time. It is very responsive. Also clicking down any of the face buttons, triggers, uh, back buttons, everything is going to be registered here as it should. Now, if you want to rebind your buttons, that is going to be done right here. You do have four configurations, which can be swapped on the fly via that little screen. Screen. Whenever you make changes, it will prompt you to actually save the configuration, flash it to the controller's memory, its profile storage, if you will. So that's nice. Now we're over here in joystick and we can set up custom thumbstick curves. You can also do this separately for the left and right stick, which I love. And you can also control the sensitivity of your mouse cursor, which by tapping the home button will turn it on and off to where you actually control the mouse cursor of Windows just by tilting your controller. Also an interesting note, I'm controlling my mouse cursor right now with the left analog stick. That's so cool. You have low, medium, high and off for the vibration sensitivity. It'd be kind of nice if there was a slider or bar where you could really fine tune it, but no big deal. You can also test it, which I really do like. 
that might not even be picked up by the microphone because it is incredibly quiet. It's a very low vibration, very not hollow and tinny and rumbly and crappy. It sounds very secure and nice, very quiet. And you can adjust the color of this little LED right here. This is going to be full button remapping. You can remap not only the rear buttons, but also all the face buttons, D-pad, etc. This is fine tuning of your motion sensing. So that gyroscope, which you can also use to control the mouse on screen, which I like. Wow. And now that I'm plugged into the PC, there is an insane amount of resistance. I mean, it is it is much stronger than the PlayStation 5. Dual since I got to use some serious finger strength here to squeeze these triggers right now. That is awesome. Oh, wow. Oh, boy. And I didn't even have it on full. Now I'm at 255, which is the maximum value. And it is it's hard to pull those triggers. My goodness, those are strong motors in there. Now, these are going to be four separate profiles for the triggers. General, racing, auto and sniper, which you can customize each individual one and save that to one of these profiles. Then over here in switch, you actually have separate settings as opposed to just the PC settings being all blended together. I do like that if you want separate configurations or profiles for your console versus your PC. Third road for the iOS if you're using this as a mobile controller as well, which it tells me, hey, firmware's too low. Update that bad boy. In case you're wondering how to do that, click on this little exclamation icon and you're going to have updates of a plenty. One for the app, which if you just install the fresh copy, it should be up to date. But then you also have firmware, trigger firmware, SI firmware, dongle version. Oh boy, it'd be so rad if you could just implement this into a one-click update process for everything. Holy cow, that's always a fun little quirk. It's telling me your controller is going to be unused usable if you don't calibrate it after this upgrade. Oh, cool. It's going to pop up an article for me. This is the kind of quirky stuff with controllers that I don't necessarily enjoy. I just kind of want it to work. Okay, cool. Chinese characters up here. We got a little English down here. Make sure the controller's on. That's always a good first step. The screen will display these Egyptian hieroglyphics to enter the calibration mode. It's a little complicated. You got to do a do re mi, spin around twice, touch your nose, grab a hammock full of banana peppers, twist your niblets twice, double tap both the triggers, and then take a deep breath and you should be there. And now it's telling me once I've done that upgrade that the controller is now unusable because I've got to update the triggers as well. So we're going to we're going to do those now in order to get the full functionality of the adaptive triggers and control those bad boys in game where you can set up in game settings. Click on this adaptive trigger and you do need to activate your adaptive triggers. So I'm going to do that now. Oh, not that easy, buddy. Hold on there. You need to select your game directory. So I'm going to select cyberpunk over here and I'm going to activate those triggers. OK, cool. That didn't work, but you can manually scan for your directory here. It makes it pretty easy on my PC because I have a separate NVMe that's specifically for games. So in here, I have all of my launchers, Origin, Epic, Steam for sure, Game Pass for PC, all that good stuff. And you can browse a Rooney. Then you need to actually launch the game through here. I have noticed that these settings on the triggers don't take effect. If I just try and launch the game through Steam or its native launcher, you have to start the game through this as if it's like a dedicated launcher. A lot of steps, hoopla, hoops to jump through just to get adaptive triggers that don't work quite like you're expecting. If you're used to playing natively on the PlayStation 5, it, it, you have to do a lot of con trickery on your end and the user experience still isn't that native. Whoa, holy bejesus. It, it, now it's downloading that mod. This is another thing that you need to do. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, it's fine. Let it on in. So you need to do this for each individual game that you plan on using these adaptive triggers for. So if I click on Forza or Red Dead, activate the adaptive triggers. But if I come over to Cyberpud over here, oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, cl just clicking off the game. You also need to reactivate it. I just had it activated a second ago. Let's reactivate it again. There we go. It's green. It's activated. Now we can launch Cyberpunk. Hey, cool. It just popped open the red launcher. We're getting somewhere. Also, we have to talk about Cyberpunk 2077 for just a minute. There's going to be a massive video coming over the next couple days as that game's gone through a full overhaul between the update or patch 2.0 and then the Phantom Liberty expansion. There's a lot going on. Okay, now it's saying this right here. Set first time setup. Okay, I can't click overlay key. It doesn't do anything. Awesome. Can I get this out of my screen so I can play the game? That'd be so sick. All right, we'll just put you down here in the corner for now. All right, over here in Cyberpunk 2077, I'm going to give you a demo of these adaptive triggers as they do work. It's the closest thing you're going to get to adaptive triggers on PC other than using the software program DSX, which is a $5 buy on Steam in combination with a DualSense controller. But if you just want to purchase a controller that has an Xbox layout that has adaptive triggers or, you know, the closest thing you can get to adaptive triggers on PC, this is it. So as I squeeze this trigger, I'm going to hit a wall at about halfway where nothing happens until I squeeze a little bit further. Bam. Okay, well, I didn't have a round chambered. Okay, I'm out of ammo. What the fuck? Okay, well, it just completely stopped working and went irresponsive, but uh, you can still hear the triggers. 
Yeah, that motor's working in there. And, you know, just trust me, you know, Scout's Honor, it, it was working real good a second ago. Also, I cannot find any way to get rid of this overlay, so you just kind of got to tuck it down here and then pull it up as you need it. It says use this hotkey to toggle overlay on and off, but you can't click it. And I'm assuming maybe there's a hotkey on the controller. I've pressed every single button there and it's not making this go away. But it's okay because I don't really foresee myself running this program in the background and using these adaptive triggers for PC after this review. Oh, that's awesome. The gameplay doesn't have that weird haze anymore. It almost looked like it was forcing HDR into my gameplay footage, which is I have an HDR monitor, but I don't record in HDR through OBS because then it looks all hazy and weird in the gameplay footage and I can't have that for you guys, but um, now it looks better. Maybe I rebound the trigger to reload or something because it just don't want to shoot for me. That left trigger is aiming down sights though. Getting our first pull and X input test to get our stock input lag or delay, I'm seeing some massive numbers in here. Also not very consistent as they are bouncing back and forth like the two cylinders on a Harley V-Twin. Also took forever to complete the test because the PC isn't receiving those thousand samples very quickly. 33 milliseconds of input lag or delay. Cannot be correct. Let's troubleshoot real quick. I can confidently say this controller has either a 100 or 125 hertz, probably 125 as that is a more common value, stock pulling rate, giving it around 10 milliseconds of input lag or delay, making it the slowest wire connection in the fly digi lineup despite being the most expensive model also minimum and maximum are very far from each other meaning this is not a very consistent wired connection as well and this is as accurate as a test as you can get in x input test there is only one outlier well technically zero outliers would be the best test you can get which is going to be one really big or small number that does not agree with the rest of its homies really disappointing numbers and i hope this gets tightened up during overclocking and you cannot run this test while you're in d input mode to get the speeds for that although it would be substantially slower because d input is a much older technology and uh, the controllers that existed when D input was the standard input lag and delay wasn't even like a primary forethought or even a major point of consideration with controllers. You are rarely if ever going to use D input on a modern controller unless you're using a really old gamer launcher. Now we've broken our chains. We are untethered by wire and <laughs> it actually looks like I'm getting faster speeds with the wireless dongle or adapter. They're not consistent. They are all over the road. Hmm, I was wrong too. It's also slower, but Jesus weird deviations. Those spurts or sputters is not good good. They're, and they're so consistently inconsistent, if you will, meaning that there is a pattern that occurs over and over. If you scroll through these numbers, they're not actual outliers because that's just the way that the controller runs wirelessly, which isn't good. It's going to get you about 14 milliseconds of input lag or delay on God knows what of a stock clock, probably like 80. Peculiar because the Vader 3 that I just reviewed had pretty good numbers, both wired and wireless popping up on screen here. Let's check the Bluetooth card out and see how that'd be like. Wishful thinking, you stupid idiot. Bluetooth is only going to be for Switch, iOS, and Android. If you're on the PC side of the house, you're going wired or with that wireless dongle. It's weird. It's blatantly weird. If it has a Bluetooth card on board and your motherboard on your computer has Bluetooth, you should be able to connect to it via Bluetooth. We're about to test the input lag or delay going wireless with that dongle. But when you are going wireless, you have substantially more options in this little menu. You can't see a goddamn thing because it won't autofocus. That's okay. I'll read it to you. You got X input, D input, switch mode, Android mode, flash P mode, and iOS mode. In comparison to going wired on the PC where you only have D and X input. Over here in the Lord of Mice overclocking program in this drop down, select all, and you're going to see yourself a 360 controller for Windows, not overclocked on the stock clock for, well, like, I don't know, 16 milliseconds of input lag or delay. It's actually a little bit more than that. That bitch is slow as hell. Now we're doing this a little bit different. We're going to start trying to overclock wired with the dongle and then go wired. Install service and you open. 1000, install service, you open. Filter on device, install that service and you open. Unplug or turn off the controller in this case. Turn it back on with that dip switch in the back. Took a second, had me nervous, sweating bullets, but yes, we are now overclocked on a thousand hertz for an estimated one millisecond of input lag or delay. I don't think so, but let's test the theory out. Throwing that ass in a circle or more specifically the left analog stick, I am seeing uh, about the same results as we saw before, meaning that the overclock didn't do much of anything for us besides maybe tighten up making a more consistent connection. No, it didn't even do that for us. Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go wired. Now that we are tethered and tangled by cable, it's showing that we are not overclocked by this method. Let's fix that bullshit. Give me the business over here. That's not giving me the business. That's giving me the same exact numbers that I saw before in the stock configuration. You can go fuck yourself. So rolling right into the pros, cons, and verdict. But before I do, I want to touch on the fact that we didn't really cover the charging dock, the little cradle that is sold separately. I really think it should be included with the flagship highest thin model that they do offer. But anywho, it does look and feel a whole hell of a lot better than it appeared to in that Amazon listing where the picture that they're using, I advise them to change that immediately because it made the build quality look horrendous when IRL, it, it really isn't that bad. But this gamepad that I'm holding with 
with excellent trigger discipline is a good controller for PC. Is it a good controller for Switch? This is pretty expensive for what I'm willing to spend for a Nintendo Switch controller for that specific platform just because I'm not playing any FPS games, you know, any third person shooters or anything like that, at least not multiplayer or any kind of competitive sense. And you can get pro controllers for the Switch for between 40 and $75 that are actually pretty good. So for that platform, I would say absolutely not. But for the PC side of the house, I would still say probably not because for the price point, I feel like there are better options out there. For example, like I keep throwing it out there, but the Gamester G7 is substantially cheaper at $45. They have a version that's $5 more, much, much less likely to get stick drift for you because it uses Hall Effect thumbstick modules, not potentiometers. Good. But for this price point, things like the input lag and delay wired in with that dongle, and you cannot use Bluetooth despite the fact that this has a Bluetooth card, which is really weird. The adaptive triggers I'm going to list as a con because I know that was definitely an expensive component that added to the build costs, having those motors in there, and it doesn't really add that much immersion because you can only control it from the screen. It's not per game built into the software or anything like that, like on the PlayStation 5. So that money could have been allocated elsewhere. Same thing with this OLED screen. Haphazardly hard to navigate if you are in North America or speak English. And then you get the rear buttons that just really aren't that great. These two aren't terrible, but then the inner ones sound different, feel different. They're also over here. Why? Why should rear buttons or paddles be over here ever? Right? Let me show you where they should be. Hey, everyone watching. They should be right here and right there where my ring fingers are laying where when you span out all four of your fingers you got clickies here and clickies here my personal favorite rear button layout and a shitload of controllers offer that battle beaver and hyper and hex's xbox controller all fit that bill this not so much and since there is so many options out there a big vast world of pro controllers other options that i like better and overall just seem like a better controller for the money i can't really give this my stamp and sigil of approval as a full-blown pc recommendation but i'm also not saying that it's a bad controller and not to pick it up. I know that's really vague and nilly-willy, like I can't just commit to a verdict here, but it's got pros. It's got a great D-pad. It's got these mechanical face buttons. It's got some grippy-ass thumbsticks, although they're pretty fucking short. But I feel like me personally, there's five or six other game pads that I'd grab before this in the same price point. And in case you're wondering, Kevin, are you going to tell me what those are? I did do a big comparison of my favorite Xbox controllers recently, and I'm going to be doing the same thing for the PlayStation and Nintendo Switch platforms. So you can just watch those videos and know my tier list breakdown of all the controllers that I like. But then if you want more in-depth information, a deep dive, then you go to the individual reviews, then I'll also have a separate tutorial section where we do things like overclocking and polling rate checking and shit like that. This is linked in the description below. All versions. This one, the other one, probably some other Fly Digi controllers that I like and have reviewed. It, it, it's down there. Peace. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry. Tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of Gamer Heaven, join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where I go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my pH balance is on point. Just kidding. Starting June, I'm going to be live streaming a lot. Thanks for watching. This has been AK40 Kevin hosting Gamer Heaven, and I'll see you tomorrow because I upload daily, all the time, 60% of the time, sometimes, most of the time. Peace.